In the last video, we looked at a couple of examples of amplifiers with negative feedback, and we saw the effect on the input, output impedance, and gain. In this video, I would like to look in particular at the shunt-shunt configuration. What would happen if you were to look at a circuit and identify the feedback type incorrectly? For example, if you thought it was shunt-shunt feedback when it was actually series-series. If you were to identify the type of feedback incorrectly, then you would likely have difficulties writing the feedback in this standard form. As I've mentioned in one of the previous videos, this model only includes feedback. In other words, the output affects the input. But in practical circuits, since these feedback networks tend to be made of resistors, we also have feed forward. In other words, the input can also affect the output through the feedback network. However, since the output input signals tend to be larger than the input signals because they've just gone through an amplifier, the effect of the feed forward tends not to matter so much like the feedback. I'd like to now look at a practical example of an amplifier in the shunt-shunt configuration. In particular, we're going to look at an op-amp, but we're going to assume that the op-amp is non-ideal. In other words, it has a non-infinite internal gain, it has a non-infinite internal impedance, and it has a non-zero output impedance. The general strategy for analyzing this particular circuit and in other feedback circuits is outlined in the box. We're first going to identify the feedback type, we're going to replace the feedback network with equivalent sources, neglect sources that don't matter, and then we're going to try to write the circuit in a standard form. This will make sense once we do the example. First, let's identify the feedback type. We already know that it's shunt shunt, but if I were an ant crawling from the source towards the amplifier, it's clear that I would encounter the feedback network first. This is shunt. If I start at the load resistor and I walk back towards the amplifier, clearly I cross the feedback path. This is shunt. In the shunt-shunt configuration, the input should be a current, the output should be a voltage. This is a trans-resistance amplifier, and A should have the units of ohms, beta should have the units of inverse ohms. If we look back at the circuit, however, this is not what we have. The correct form of the feedback is now shown. Furthermore, with shunt-shunt feedback, we expect the gain to be reduced, we expect the input impedance to be reduced, and we expect the output impedance to be reduced relative to the case of the amplifier without the feedback. The correct feedback form shows that the input is a current, but our circuit shows the input as a voltage. So we're going to have to do something about that. One way to do it is to just convert the source to the Norton equivalent. I've also labeled in this diagram the test source at the output side, which we're going to eventually need in order to determine the output impedance. I've marked the input impedance and output impedance in what you might consider to be a very unusual place. I've labeled the input impedance before the source resistance, and I've labeled the output impedance after the load. That's a bit unusual, but the reason I've done it is because the feedback, for example, makes the output impedance dependent on the load. If you were to change the load resistor, you would change the output impedance. That's not the case for some amplifiers, but it is the case with non-ideal amplifiers with negative feedback. If you were to need the output impedance without the load attached, you can always subtract it away later, but one needs to keep in mind that the output impedance does depend on the load, so if the load resistance were to change, the output impedance might change too. Step two in our general strategy is to replace the feedback resistor with Norton or Thevenin sources. The correct feedback form tells us whether or not we need to replace it with a Norton source or a Thevenin source. In this situation, since we need current on the input side, we should use a Norton source. On the output side, we should use a Thevenin source, since the feedback form calls for voltage. Our strategy is to split the feedback so that the resistor RF isn't connecting the output and the input. Looking forward through the feedback network, we need to find the Norton equivalent source. The Norton equivalent resistance is not just RF, because there are other resistors connected to this node. However, RF is a good approximation. Our Norton current is just the output voltage divided by the feedback resistance. At the output side, we need a Thevenin source. In other words, we're going to approximate the effect of the feedback resistor with a Thevenin source. 
We have additional resistors attached to V minus. We have the source resistance and we have the input impedance to the amplifier. Assuming the source impedance is small relative to the feedback resistor, we can neglect it. And then the Thevenin equivalent resistance is just RF. Let's substitute these sources back into our circuit. Because our Norton source is our output voltage divided by RF, we can now identify beta as being 1 over RF. The next step in our general strategy is to neglect the tiny source. V minus should be small relative to the output voltage because this is the signal before it's amplified. Therefore, we're going to cross it off. As previously mentioned, we can approximate our Thevenin equivalent resistance with just RF, even though the real resistance would be a little bit higher. Let's now go to step four and try to write it in standard form. Let's use Ohm's law at the input side. V equals IR, the voltage V minus equals the two currents times the three resistors in parallel. Let's apply voltage division at the output side. When we're trying to calculate the gain, we're going to set the test current equal to zero. We only use that test current when we're trying to calculate the output impedance of the circuit. With that current source turned off, we just have the output impedance given by standard voltage division. If I substitute the equation for V minus into the equation for the output voltage, I can eliminate V minus from the equation. Let's then define A as all of these terms which are effectively constants in the circuit. I can then express the output voltage as A times IS plus beta V naught. This is the standard form of the gain for the shunt-shunt configuration. Let's now calculate the input impedance of this particular circuit as it's labeled in the circuit diagram. That is, I'm including the resistor R sub S in the calculation for the input impedance. Let's use my test source because of the presence of this controlled source in the circuit. The resistance Rn equals V minus divided by the source current. I can substitute in my V minus I can then identify A in the circuit, and I'm now solved for the input impedance. Other than the feedback resistor, we can see that the form of this equation for input impedance matches what we have on the chart in the ideal case. That is, the input impedance is reduced because of the negative feedback. Calculating the output impedance is a little more challenging. The first thing I'd like to point out in this circuit is that the output impedance is not simply these two resistors in parallel plus R out one. That's not true because of the presence of the control source. If this were not a controlled source, I could just short it and that would be true. It's not true in this circuit because that controlled source depends on the output itself. Let's keep our derivation of V minus and our definition of A. We're going to need that in order to properly calculate the output impedance. From the definition of A, I can rewrite A naught, the internal gain of the op amp, in terms of A and the other constants in the circuit. Let's then calculate the quantity A naught times V minus minus as this will be useful later in the derivation of the output impedance. I'm going to label this current as I2 and I'm going to label the current that's passing down through these two resistors as I1. I first want to apply Ohm's law to resistor R out 1. The voltage across that resistor equals the current times the resistance. I can determine current I2. Secondly, I can apply Ohm's law to these two resistors as well. I can now determine I1. Finally, I can apply the Kirchhoff current law at node V out. Let's now find the output impedance, but to make the calculations a little bit cleaner, I'm going to find the reciprocal of the output impedance first. The output voltage cancels in two of these terms. These two terms can be combined as resistors in parallel. We've already conveniently written this term down. Let's substitute it in. The output voltage cancels. Furthermore, I can see that we have resistors which are multiplied in the denominator and added in the numerator. This corresponds to resistors in parallel. I've now determined the output impedance of the circuit. Clearly, shunt feedback at the output side of the circuit has served to reduce the output impedance relative to the case without the feedback attached. Furthermore, we can see the effect of the feedback resistor in this calculation. 
In summary, with the shunt shunt configuration, feedback has served to reduce the gain, reduce the input impedance, and reduce the output impedance. In the next video, we'll look at the shunt series configuration with a transistor circuit.